You're listening to Blast Podcasting, Episode 10. Final Fantasy IX rocks. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Blast Podcasting. This is Anthony. And this is Xander. I kind of upped the radio voice there, homie. <laughs> yeah, you, you got up there a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I don't have a really deep voice, so it go. It, it's not really deep when I up the voice or down the voice, whatever. <laughs> Well, I mean, we got we got a pretty interesting show this episode, uh, and we're going to start off first talking about some uh, movie talk. Uh, Yay! And a trailer that just uh, debuted uh, this week from recording, and that is Joker with Joaquin Phoenix. Yeah, I don't know. It looks like a Scorsese film. Mm-hmm. Is that a bad thing? Not necessarily, but is that a bad thing for a comic book movie? Might be. Yeah, it's it's very it's very different to me. It makes me think of like it gave me the same feeling as when Fox debuted uh, Logan, where it was like this isn't really a superhero movie, but it's a superhero movie. Yeah, it's weird. Yeah, very weird. But here's the here's the thing. Logan turned out good. Mm-hmm. This might turn out good. Yeah, I don't. I don't think this is going to have a humorous tone. I think this is why I prefer the DC films mostly, mostly because they're a little bit more darker and edgier and not edgy to be edgy, but you know what I mean? Yeah. They have a different um, kind of tone to it. And and I think that's what hurt Justice League because they were trying to be a Marvel movie. It's what hurt Aquaman. Yeah. I've heard Shazam is good. I'm going to go see it Saturday, I think. I but, I have to admit, I'm really stoked about Shazam because a lot of people that I've talked to have seen it, have really liked it, and they said it almost feels like a 90s comedy, if that makes I've any been sense. To- I've been told a different analogy. It feels like it has the darkness of, say, something like Goonies or Gremlins to it. Oh, wow. So that's why I'm pretty pumped because they said the trailers, which showed the more humorous pieces, aren't really representative of the movie. Ah, uh, yeah, that's, that's what I've heard. So it's not necessarily a bad thing because I mean the, the way things are now, uh, like a good example would be like the new Pet Cemetery. Every- I want to see that too. I've heard that everything that was worth watching that movie it was like in the trailer, and I hate it when movies do that. Like you can watch the trailer and be done with it. I've heard Pet Cemetery is really good though. I've heard yeah. and it's I heard it's really good, so that might not be the case. Real quick before we talk about Joker, there's three movies out and I'm, you know, spending money on games. Fuck. But um <laughs> instead of movies, but there's Shazam, Pet Cemetery, and I also want to see Howlboy. Yeah. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I w- I want to see the new Howlboy. It looks pretty interesting. Oh yeah, for sure, for sure. But as for Joker though, yeah, it looks like a Scorsese film. And that, that's not a surprise because he is involved in that. I don't know if you knew that. I didn't know that. Yeah, he's a producer. Huh. And think about it. You know, like Robert De Niro's in there too. Mm-hmm. Go figure, right? Scorsese or De Niro. And I know producer is a very loose term. But I've heard that when Spielberg or Scorsese or some of those guys get involved in certain films, they kind of add their flavor to it regardless. Yeah, it makes sense. Like, I don't know, and I won't go into detail about this, but you've heard about the Poltergeist issue, right? That movie, Pol- the original Poltergeist. Yeah. Where there's a debate over who directed Was it Spielberg or was it Toby Hooper? Yeah. Yeah. So, I don't know. But, I don't know, Joker will be good. I'm um, kind of hope it. you know, it's kind of funny because it's repeating what Venom did last year. Yeah, can I like movie that? In October. Yeah, yeah, the whole like anti-hero or, or or villain per se with Joker. I mean, there's it, Joker's it, not an anti-hero. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it, it looks it looks like it's gonna be really good. I know a lot of people were like, it was kind of funny because a lot of people were like, man, that movie looks kind of weird. I'm like, it it looks like a Joker movie to me, you know, like because it the whole the whole movie, like I watched it and all I could hear in the back of my head was one bad day. You know, yeah. like the killing joke, one bad day, that's all it takes. And it's just like, it, it looks like a guy, a, a tortured, like wounded person just gets to the, that unbreakable point of no return and turns into right. the Joker. And, and, and oh, they, did you see they also have uh, a young Bruce Wayne and um, Bruce Wayne's dad's going to be in the movie too. He's actually the politician in it. 
know that. Yeah, like in the in the trailer, like where he's making that little kid smile, that's a young Bruce Wayne. Hmm. So Well, can I can I go can I recommend some Joker stories for people to read? Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. If you're getting pumped up for the movie. I, I I'm with you though. The movie looks cool, and I guarantee you that clown get up is not his look. Yeah, yeah. It's it's kind of like a uh to me it's probably like a prototype Joker. A red Harry. Yeah. Because I bet, you know, the whole – a because we saw a little bit of Batman, so I bet the Ace Chemical thing is going to happen too. And Well, mm-hmm. no, his dad's in it, huh? But we saw Batman in it, right? Not not, in the, jo- not in the Joker trailer. Okay. Okay. But he's going he's gonna to fall into the Ace Chemical vat somehow. Yeah. And that's going to be a key part of it. As for Joker stories, of course, Xander, you can't go wrong with killing Joke. There's not much to say there, right? Right. Um, some other ones though, um, I, one that I like, you can probably find in trade paperback is called the man who laughs. And I, I don't know if you've ever heard of this one, Xander. No, no, I haven't. It's really good because I'll suggest this with another piece. Cause it, it'll make sense. This is actually a retelling of Batman number one from 1940, uh-huh. because that was the first Joker story. Yeah. And it's it's a damn good one. Um, and surprisingly, I I like Batman number one. I have it digitally. Of course, I'm too poor to buy an original, and I wouldn't read it anyway. But um, Batman number one, the first Joker story, is really good because the Joker was already. It's one of those few characters in comics that gets created and is defined right away. Yeah. Like for example, Wolverine, his first appearance. He was no not defined. You know, most characters are not defined in their first appearance. It takes a while or another writer to define him. Joker was not that's not the case with him. So so that one that one's really good. Um from the new fifty two, I would recommend uh Death in the Family. Oh yeah, a that's pe- classic. That's a good uh, Death of the Family, my bad. Death in the Family. Are you thinking about the one where he kills Robin? No, I'm I'm thinking about the one where um he it's it's like he had all the uh he had like Batgirl had everyone and that's when he like cut his face yeah 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 yeah, that's it death of the family yeah that's a some people say that's a little anticlimactic though but the ending makes sense Mm. i like it they say it's anticlimactic i don't want to spoil it but if you since you read it you probably know what i'm talking about but i don't think it's anticlimactic now, what about, uh, I don't think Joker's in that one, uh, the Batman Long Halloween? He is. but And that's my favorite Batman story, mm-hmm. period. I love the Long Halloween. But the thing about the Long Halloween is Joker, he plays a, a decent size role, but he's not. It's mostly, a it's really a Two-Face story. And Two-Face yeah. is my favorite Batman villain. Mm. So there's that. Um trying to think there's a couple more um yeah well i think that's about it <laughs> yeah now, now i was gonna i was gonna ask you another thing while we're on the joker talk because the same just about the same day that re- they revealed the the joker trailer they revealed the actual transformation of joker or aka J in the gotham tv show now i never I don't a- watch that and I was going to ask you if you ever watched Scott. I don't watch it. My sister does. I've gotten some of. I've watched some of the trailers and some of the footage because I will say, out of everything, I think the guy who plays like the young Joker is really fucking good. I can't remember his name, but he was like the redheaded kid in Shameless, and he plays a really good Joker. I mean he he does a really good job, kind of like melting the psychotic of Heath Ledger but with the mannerisms of uh, Jack Nicholson see that's the thing I, I watched the first couple episodes of, of Gotham mm-hmm. to be fair I didn't get into it but remember something though it's the pilot and first couple episodes some series that I love take a while like you ever see Spartacus no I haven't seen that the first the first half of that season is fucking dumb Ah. Uh. But man, afterwards, until its final season, it's pretty fucking good. But it's a little bit gross. That's a whole different thing. My point is, is it takes some TV series a little while. So I might give Gotham another shot someday. It's, it's, on, say, it's, it's on Netflix. Is it? Okay. Yeah. 
I'll wait till they put this current season because I guess this season right now is the last one. Yeah, because apparently uh, they've already showed leaks of uh, he he actually turns into Batman at the in this series. You know, you got to give Gotham one thing though, and I've heard it's, this is another good series, but it didn't take them eleven years to become Batman like it did Superman in Smallville. Yeah, because that show was eleven seasons, dude. Yeah, and I know I know Gotham like has his hit or miss. Uh, I know some people. It's it's one of the shows that I've talked to people that either they love it or they cannot stand it. Yeah, and and I mean the thing about it is is like you just got to keep in mind that this is a retelling that this isn't necessarily going to be comic book accurate anyway. Of course, you know? yeah, yeah. You got to keep that in mind with most adaptations too. Yeah, I guess my thing is is that I'm not. I guess it's I'm not too keen on prolonged origin stories. Yeah. If that makes sense. And what I say about that is 11 years to become Superman. And it's w such a weird show because if you look at it, they've introduced all his villains. Yeah. I mean, Doomsday, Darkseid, fucking the Justice Society, all kinds of shit. They introduced the whole DC universe, but he's not Superman, which makes no sense to me. So. Yeah. So that's probably my thing with Gotham, too. But I see your point. It's a different adaptation. That's fine. That doesn't bother me. It's just I'm just not into prolonged origins, which is why I give the CW shows like Arrow and Flash credit, you know, mm -hmm. and even Supergirl. So even though I can't really get into that one and I haven't watched Flash in years. Well, well, mo moving moving from that. Because this episode is going to be about some Final Fantasy. I know some people are listening. They're like, well, are you guys going to talk about Final Fantasy? Oh, I got one more thing to say. Oh, yeah, you, you did You did have one thing. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah. I beat Mario 3 again. Oh, yeah? And I know some people are like, yeah, I, be I beat it on Switch this time. Last time I beat it was in four 2014 on my 3DS. There is a reason. Now, it hit me last time, but it's even hitting me harder. There's a reason why that is considered one of the greatest games of all time. Oh, it's, like, my, it's my number one. It's my number one favorite game of all time. I can see that. I can see that. I'm a little bit of a narrative guy, so my favorite game is laying towards one with deeper narratives. Mm -hmm. But if you want to just talk about pure gameplay and strip away narratives, I would say that would be my number one, too. Yeah. And the thing is, is uh, like... I'm discovering new things. Some people are going to laugh at one of the things I discovered this time. But I didn't know, like, when you're on the airship and you have, you know, those flames mm -hmm. that uh, spit out. I didn't know if you turn fell, if you transferred into the Tanuki statue midair and fell on them, you would destroy the flame. Yeah. Yeah. It's 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 weird. And, and what's funny about that game is you don't think of story, but really, you know, there's a reason why you need a thematic value to the game. Like, the Mario quirkiness adds to it. Like, mm -hmm. just going into that world and just, you know, it, it, if it was just, just take, strip all of the thematic elements and say the game was designed exactly the same way. Right, Xander? Yeah. But it was really just dick people and dots. I think the game would lose something, would lose it. Even if the gameplay was as perfect as it is, I think it would lose it. And I think that's what makes that game special is the thematics of it. Wouldn't you agree? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just... I I I'm, I made a video my my top ten favorite games of all time, uh, recently, and and that was that mm. was number one, and it's because Super Mario Three is like my comfort food game. Like oh, yeah. uh, when I was out of town during our uh, Hurricane Florence, I that's right around the time that the Switch started having uh, the online. And, right. I got, and I got Super Mario Brothers 3, and I played that while I was out of town. And, like, for that little bit of time that I was playing it and I beat it, I was, like, not even thinking about hurricanes. I wasn't thinking about, you know, what's, what's my house look like right now because I was out of town, you know. Um, and every year, every year, every Thanksgiving, that's what I play. I play it all the way through. I play Super Mario Brothers 3. That game is so special, man, to me, too. It really I don't is. know. When did you first play it? I, I play I, it. Was my, it was my game that came with my NES. Okay. See, I got it. Let's see. I'm a little bit older than you. What, about a couple years, right? Yeah, I'm 33. Okay, I'm 36. So, um, I played it in 1990. And wow. I remember I remember that game came out in February of 1990. And what was hyped for... Well, my experience was probably like a lot of kids my age, and maybe even yours, 
where I saw the fucking wizard. Yeah. I, I got taken to see the wizard because it was part of my Christmas gift. And my grandparents who raised me, they knew I was a Nintendo freak, right? Yeah. So they took me to go see the wizard. And I remember, um, you know, at the end of the movie, that's the big reveal. Because that's what that movie is. It's an advertisement for Super Mario Brothers 3. Yeah, it's just one long Nintendo advertisement. That's all it is. With so some bullshit product. sentimentality yeah. in it. And a lot of child endangerment. What? <laughs> I said California. <laughs> <laughs> Power glove, so rad. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and a lot of, what, child endangerment, too. Yeah, oh, my gosh. But, I mean, you, you had you had Fred but Savage, who was, I like, saw that. the big guy, you know. Yeah. <laughs> you still there, Anthony? I think I scared you away with Fred Savage. Hello, hello. Xander. There you go. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> you want to count down? And, uh, no, no, I no, no, no. It's fine, it's fine. Okay. <laughs> I was like, you I, said... scared, I scared you away with Fred Savage. <laughs> oh, shit, okay. Well, with, with Fred Savage was a pretty big star back then. Yeah, he? yeah, he was huge. He was he was real popular, and he's still around. Mm -hmm. You know, he was even in that Deadpool PG thirteen a couple months ago. Yep. But um, but I watched that, and one thing I do remember too is well because I went to see it. They were giving these booklets. Man, I still wish I had it, but they had booklets, and mm -hmm. the booklets had tips in it and previews. And one of the coolest thing was it had this big old spread for Super Mario Brothers three, and it had Mario in the raccoon suit flying away from the airship and Princess. Peach was tied up to the airship, and you see the Bowser kids and shit. And I remember that blew my mind for some reason. Because it showed how epic that game is. And I'm not one that likes to use epic. I'm an English major. But fuck, Mario 3 is epic, even compared to some of the Mario games that have come out. Yeah, there's a reason why, it, it to this day, there's even Mario games that have came out that's kind of model itself after Super Mario Bros. 3 in some shape and or form. And mo most Mario games are pretty absolutely above the bar of most games. But yeah. Mario 3, I think, is on that upper echelon. I know there's people who like World better. I like World a lot, but it's not up there with 3. I think 3 is the better game, personally. Well, it, you know, my, my, my thing is weird. For the okay. fact that Super Mario Bros. 3 is my favorite game of all time, but Super Mario World is my favorite Mario game of all time. I got you. That makes sense. Are you sense. keeping those separate? Yeah, yeah, it's it's separate. Oh, okay, okay. Like, okay. Uh, yeah, it, it's weird because I feel like the like the epitome Mario game, like the one Mario game that I'm like, okay, this is above all what I really, really enjoy is Super Mario World. But Super Mario Brothers three, if it wasn't for Super Mario Brothers three, you wouldn't have Super Mario World. No, you wouldn't. And just so many little nuances. For example, I beat I don't know which world it was, but I beat one of them with the Tanuki suit. Yeah. And the dialogue changes. Yeah. Thank you, Raccoon, for saying... They don't say thank you, Mario. They say thank you, Raccoon. Yeah, yeah, they have, like, they... Yeah, and if you're, if you're dressed as the frog, it changes, too. Yeah. Yeah, I wonder if it changes if you're the Hammer Brothers, though. I think, I think if you change into a Hammer Brother, I think they're actually kind of mean to you because they think you're a Koopa. Oh, shit, we, I should try that. Yeah. Yeah, see, that game is great. Before we move on, because I know we're probably, we don't want to run too short on our main topic, because it's a, a another favorite series of ours. But I did, I don't know, can we talk about emulation? Uh, I mean, we can talk a little bit about it. Okay, I have a modded PSP, and I have GBA games on there. Mm -hmm. So I got curious, because I know the GBA version of Mario 3 is pretty well received. Mm -hmm. And I will say, I prefer the NES version because it's more, it's special to me, and it's probably special to you, the NES version. Yeah. But, but I will say, though, that the GBA version and the All-Star, those added effects like the underground levels looking more underground instead of some weird ice thing like they do in the NES, like yeah. the bluish. Yeah, they, or, they well, I was going to say was the, because you're referring to Super Mario Advance 4, which is Super Mario yeah, Brothers 3. Yeah. Now, what's what's interesting about that game is it uses a lot of the same graphical mechanics as, or updates as Super Mario All Stars, right? 
which they, they, they did change that. They made the underground look more like underground instead of ice. But another thing they changed to the GBA version was things like voiceovers. And also, don't mm-hmm. forget the uh, e-card, the e-card levels. Oh, I, I can't do that. In my but you can. But... You can in one shape other than emulation. Mm-hmm. You can also, if you purchase the game on your Wii U, it comes oh. with all those levels. Oh, shit, it does, huh? Yeah. And is the Wii U eShop on there? Yep. Motherfucker. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll try that. How were those e-card levels? They, they're so wild. I mean, because okay. it has elements of Super Mario Brothers 2 and the Super Mario Brothers 3 formula. Because you're picking up weird. radishes and shit. It's weird. What the fuck? Okay. But that sounds kind of neat. But I'll say this, Xander, about the game. Um, I do like the added effects, though, in the advanced version, Super Mario Advance mm-hmm. 4. Wouldn't you agree? Like, the, like when you're on the airship, it's, you know... And I'm not degrading the NES version by any means. It's it's the version I prefer. But I do like that there's lightning in the background. and Yeah. And when you're, like, in the uh, hardcore platforming levels, where it's just pure platforming, it looks like there's clouds in the background. You're above the clouds. Mm-hmm. So added that adds a level of immersion that I like. Yeah, it's definitely a good version to play. I mean, um, like I said, when I I remember I was out of town. I was actually out of town Thanksgiving one year about two years ago, and I had that's the copy I had with me because I said every Thanksgiving I have to play Super Mario Brothers three, and I had Super Mario Advance four, and it, I was like, all right, let's get to it. So I actually beat it that year on the Game Boy Advance. And it's SP. a good port. Yeah, it's a good port, but. I think you can agree that for us, the NES version mm-hmm. is just special. Oh, yeah. And one last thing. Doesn't one of the kings turn into a Yoshi? Then- yeah, yeah, yeah. In the in, in the newer versions, like uh, All-Stars and Advance 4, he turns into a Yoshi. Which one is that? Jeez. Oh, what is it? World? What, is it World 4? Is it Giant World? Yeah. Yeah, World 4, Giant World. Yep. Now, oh, I, I, had a, I had a question because, I mean, and this is a great segue because you mentioned emulation, and this is kind of like the segue before we get into Final Fantasy, is, you know, you know, Final Fantasy VII, Final Fantasy IX just came out for the Switch. Mm-hmm. And uh, mainly Final Fantasy VII, I've been seeing a lot of folks do this. Uh, I was on a group page, and someone had posted had they had just beaten the Ruby Weapon, and they were mm-hmm. like, this is the first time in 20 years I've actually beaten this guy. I can't believe I finally did it. And you looked at the side, and they have the freaking mods on. And finally, oh, yeah. And, and I, had to, I had to be that person and be like, okay, now try it without the mods. Because here's the thing. <laughs> Final Fantasy VII and IX, uh, and this goes for the Switch. It goes for the PS4 uh, remakes. Or remasters also goes for Steam. They added these features that you can do stuff like times three to speed, uh, refill your health, refill your limit breaks or trace modes, and, and it makes the game essentially easier. No, no it makes it a cakewalk. It makes yeah. it. It makes it. You know what it turns it into? It doesn't turn it into a game. It turns it into Final it's, Fantasy Thirteen. I wouldn't go that far because I like 13. We're, we're going to have to have that debate someday. Yeah, man. yeah. Because yeah, I like 13. 13's not easy, dude. That final boss was a fucking bitch. I, n- I never did beat it. I got, I got, okay. I got really tired of it. I, I hear the game gets better as time goes by. But you know, just... I'll agree that is the flaw. A game shouldn't. But you know what? The reason I think it appealed to me just real quick is people that got bored of it, they did one thing. Auto battle. I never auto battle. Oh, yeah, I, yeah. Screw that. You know what? I don't trust. When I played Lunar way back in the PS1, I tried auto battle and got me killed too many times. Yeah. So since then, it traumatized me off of fucking auto battle. So I don't do auto battle. Yeah. Yeah. So for you, I, you know, you didn't do auto battle either, though? No, no. No. You yeah, just same, didn't like same, the game. Yeah, same reason. I, I didn't trust the the computer, and also, I, like I said, I just felt like the game. It's it, it was a slow brewer, which is one of the things I will say about Final Fantasy IX is it doesn't start off pretentious. A lot You're of right. J a lot of JRPGs, like I don't know what it is. It's like JRPGs sometimes when they start out, they try to seem to be too sophisticated in story, and they try to be like a little too upfront and just. It was like Final Fantasy 13 started off in the middle of, like, say, a Star Wars movie. 
It like mm-hmm. starts off in the middle, and it's like you need to give a shit about this person, this person, this person is who you need to really feel bad for. And I'm like, wait a minute, what's going on here? You know, it's like I I cannot stand it when games do that. Well, they give tr- me an example of one JRPG that does that. Uh, like Final Fantasy 13 is a good one, uh, just because. The beginning of it with lightning, I was like, eh, you know. Xander, you and I are going to have to have a, a talk about this. <laughs> I don't want to get into it because, yeah. you know, I'm I'm notorious for defending that game. I Look, I'm I'm not one of those, and I'm not saying you are, Brian, because yeah. I respect your opinion. And I've always gone by the mantra, and I'll probably get some hate, is I don't respect people's opinions. I respect their educated opinion. Well, I yeah. don't agree with you, you have an educated opinion, usually, even when we don't agree. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And and you know, some of my other YouTube friends like Dark Scream, you know, and whatnot. Um but aside from that though, you know, m- most Final Fantasy fans the fan base gets on my nerves because they pick and choose what games and you either get those people who say everything after six is horrible. Yeah. Or, you know, I don't I don't think the series is bad. I think fifteen, you know, say what you will about fifteen, it was great. You and I like fourteen. Yeah. You know, I haven't played 14 in a while. I know it's probably even been longer for you. Oh, yeah. It's been a couple of years for me. But I want to get back into it. And I like 14. And then 13, you know, you didn't care for it, but that's okay. I didn't, well, I like it. 12 is the one that I have issues with. Yeah, I cannot stand 12. 12, I, I'd rather play 13 than 12. I think 12 okay. is probably my least favorite Final Fantasy. See, I have, here's the funny thing I haven't played it since it came out. But Same. I bought the the Zodiac edition on PS on a PS4, mm-hmm. and I haven't touched it. I want to someday when I can dedicate to see how I feel about it. It's it's weird because we're getting all these games, and I and I know this is going to sound dumb, but I bought nine and seven, and I actually want to get ten again because I love ten. Oh, ten was great. Yeah, I want to get ten. But I just don't see double like I'll double dip on Final Fantasies over and over. I mean, I have seven on PS4, PS3, my Vita, my phone, my you know the Switch now. You yeah, know, same here. But yeah, but twelve is like I'll buy this version, I'll play it someday on my PS4, and that's that. It's just like I don't feel like buying it for the Switch. But ten, I I want to get it. Yeah, I mean, I can I can understand. I, I'm the same way. Like twelve, whenever it comes out to Switch, I'm probably not going to get it. But ten, I'm going to get that because I, I bought I bought seven and nine, and when I was buying seven, I was like, why am I buying this? As I'm checking out of the eShop, I'm like, why am I still buying this game? I was like, oh, it's only fifteen dollars. It's not too bad. <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, you know what's funny? I was I had I was in town, in the uh, in town, and I was riding with my with some family. And I had my switch connected to Hotspot, mm-hmm. and while setting it up, I was downloading, and then I looked on my phone, and Final Fantasy VII downloaded on my fucking phone is on there. That's so funny. But you know what? It's weird playing certain games on phones. Yeah. So even, even I, though I, I will say JRPGs are really good on on cell phones. Uh, I don't know. I don't. I I I guess I'm old fashioned. I want the controller. But mm-hmm. you know what's a funny thing is is I was tempted to buy Phoenix Wright on the Switch, but I have the tri- excuse me, I had the trilogy on my phone, and yeah. that plays perfectly on the phone. So I thought maybe I shouldn't get it on the Switch. Mm. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Kind of, because because what is Phoenix Wright? It's basically a point and click game, and you just touch around. Yeah, I mean, there's not a whole lot of mechanics on that sort of game. Yeah. So yeah, that would make sense being on your phone. Yeah. So, Final Fantasy, before we get into the meat and bones, I, I want to know your origin story real quick. Uh, I've, I've, I've started off with the first Final Fantasy. I was probably, I don't know, I was probably like six or seven. Because my first JRPG I played was Dragon Warrior. Right. And I remember I went to a friend's house and they had Final Fantasy and they had no idea how to play it. And I was actually showing them how to play it because they had never played an RPG before. Because, I mean, like, back then, I mean, RPGs are weren't nearly what they are now. I mean, like, you get a game, and most people thought they were playing, like, a, a like a Castlevania, like, side-scroller or Mario game or a, a racing game or flying game. You get Final Fantasy, you're thinking, oh, yeah, I'm just probably a knight, and I, I kill things. But that's really not it. It's a JRPG, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I, 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 I was your friend. 
Because I got it when I was a kid. I didn't know what the fuck I was. I didn't understand equipment, and I didn't understand that. But I didn't really play RP, get into RPGs until 1997. And I got to tell the story real quick. I think I might have told it on my before deleted channel. But here's what happened. I had a PS1, and I was coming to the realization that I did not want a Nintendo 64. Which I'm glad I, I made that decision. Not knocking the Nintendo 64. It's just, it's my least favorite Nintendo system, Xander. I don't know. If oh, same here. Feel. Same here. Oh, you do feel that way? Yeah, I don't. I don't. Oh. I don't like the N64. I mean, it, it, it Star Fox 64, a few others, but there's not much else. All, all, all the great, all the great games aside from the wrestling games that were on the N64, we can play on better consoles now. And the and the great <laughs> FPSs are outdated as fuck. Yeah. <laughs> Try playing uh, fucking GoldenEye now, dude. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, Which uh, reminds me, uh, Turok is on the eShop. Really? I don't know. I didn't really... Yeah, that's... I'll probably pass on that one. <laughs> Do you like Turok, though? I, I never played it. Eh. I'm sure it hasn't aged well. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, the summer of 97, I was reading video game magazines, and one game they were hyping the fuck out of was Seven. Mm-hmm. And I and I kind of got turned off by, by Final Fantasy because of the first one. But what happened was a friend lent me his Super Nintendo because I didn't really own a Super Nintendo at that point. And he let me play Final Fantasy Mystic Quest. <laughs> oh, wow. And for whatever reason, I liked it. Well, you know, you know what it is? It was because it was um, it was probably because it was a simpler jrpg and kind of got you get your feet wet kind of figure out yeah. what a jrpg is because i mean a lot of people knock it because they're like oh that's you know that's an easy jrpg that japan brought over here because they thought americans were stupid no i mean it was it did a good job in the sense that if you've never played a jrpg if you don't know what a jrpg is and you play it you'll know after that yeah and i'll tell you this xander about this game too to the to add to your point it's soundtrack kicks ass. Oh, it's so good. I mean, fuck off, anyone. It's not a bad game. Mystic Quest is not a bad game. It's not that bad. It's not bad. Um, but I played that, and I really liked it. And then I started looking through some old magazines, right? Mm -hmm. And you know what caught my attention? Final Fantasy VI. So in the meantime, my friend took his Super Nintendo back. And most of the games he had were um, like Super Ghouls and Ghosts and things like that. Mm-hmm. And which are all great games, but he didn't really have any RPGs. Um, so he took that those back, and I remember the day, I, the weekend, the first first weekend of school that year, my eighth grade year, I, I ran into Final Fantasy VII. Well, I had put a Super Nintendo on layaway, layaway with Final Fantasy VI, while Final Fantasy III, and I got it, and I got it that Monday after when I had to return Final Fantasy VII. So what happened was I got Final Fantasy VII shortly. So I played Final Fantasy VI and VII concurrently. Oh, wow. Yeah, a lot of people don't know that. And I was having a rough year. That was not my best year. I got bullied a lot and shit. It's hard to imagine me being bullied, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, with my temperament. But I was a, for those that don't know, I was a very shy and quiet and introverted kid. I didn't start getting like this until I got out of high school. But those games helped me through those through that year, through the first half. And I remember I beat them shortly. I beat Final Fantasy VI first, then I beat seven. But man, go playing through those games concurrently make those two games very special to me. And that's how and after that, dude, you know what happened with the PlayStation, right? We got a swarm of JRPGs Andrew. Oh yeah. Yeah, so many. And, and a lot of that's because of Final Fantasy Seven. Yeah, and you know what? I, that's all I played after that whole gen. I mean, it got me into next was tactics, Breath of Fire three, you know, and so on and so forth. And you know, two years later, I was a deep knee deep into Final Fantasy eight, Star Ocean, or Lunar, and you know, there you go. Mm -hmm. So that's my origin story. Now, now this this kind of goes into my first question because okay. because we the way we're doing this episode is we got we we both wrote down five questions each. And we're going to be going through those. So this is this is a good segue to my first question, Anthony, is when did you first play Final Fantasy IX? The day it was released in 2000. Yeah, same here. I actually got, I it, for, I got it for Christmas. I remember, um, well, I pre-ordered that game. Um, 
and I got Shenmue a week later, which we all know how it's all about that, but yeah. uh, we won't go into that. But that was a pretty exciting time, though. It really was. It was, it was an exciting time for gaming because we were leaving the sixth generation and going to the seventh. And then yeah. It, or was it the... Well, I'm trying to remember my generations here, but we were leaving the PlayStation and going to PlayStation 2. Fifth gen to sixth gen. That, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Okay. So, and one thing, just a, an antidote, is people forget we don't get Final Fantasy games often these days, right? Right. Unless it's a spin off or something, or more re releases. But for a mainline game, people forget that. 99, we got 8. 2000, we got 9. 2001, we got 10. Yep. We got in three years in consecutively. We got Final Fantasies, which was awesome, you know. And then we have to wait. Uh, and then of course, eleven came out, and we have to wait years. But I played it the day it came out, and I really liked it, and I beat it. But for whatever reason, I didn't really revisit it until two months when it was released two months ago. You know what was funny is I remember when Final Fantasy Nine came out. Uh, you know, going off a of seven and eight. A lot of my friends who were in the seven and eight were like completely like questioned about nine because the art style completely changed, mm -hmm. and they were just like, "This looks kind of kiddie," you know. But I was looking at it and I'm like, "Holy shit, they're back to like medieval times and steam engines, and you know, it wasn't so much of a sci-fi; it was more of fantasy." And that yeah. was one of the things I loved about it. Like, I I didn't care that the characters looked super deformed compared to Cloud and Squall. I like the fact that we had black mages again. You know? Oh, yeah. And you know what was cool about that was by that time, for me, you know, we had finally gotten five re-released. Yeah, remember? the anthology, yeah. Yeah. So I had, you know, of course, I, I told my origin story about six, and then we played five, and then seven and eight, and I kind of came to the conclusion, which I'm still at to this day, that every Final Fantasy is going to be different. Yeah. I knew that. And, but what I always knew at that time was that the game was going to be of a superb quality as well. It didn't matter what the thematic value was. Mm -hmm. Although I do really need to revisit eight. I have not, you yeah, know, that's the most here. controversial game in a long time. And I have it on Steam. Do you have it, Xander? Eight? I, I, I have it on my Pi. Okay. You know what? Maybe if we can find some time in the next six months or so and i'm saying six months because it's a jrpg we should revisit it yeah yeah because i haven't i haven't played it in years so. yeah i haven't played it in a long time but i kind of knew and i was excited and then i knew who Nomura was and i knew who was amano and i'm not a Nomura hater are you a Nomura hater like a lot of people are no nah. i i think his art style is fine but let's be honest amano's way better yeah there's no doubt about that. And I knew, I remember reading in something that Amano was coming back to do the character designs. Mm -hmm. Which he did. And I was super pumped. So that got me pumped up for that game, Xander. Now, now what was what was one of your questions? Ooh, let me, uh, let me get those for you, good sir. <laughs> Let's see. Okay, so what themes did you see in the game? Like, what literary thematic elements did you see? I, I felt like I felt like it was a very um, I felt like it was a very European game, not okay. in the sense not in the sense that you know it's a JRPG, not not European as in like oh I felt you know elements of European game design, but more of like the atmosphere, like Alexandria looked like old school London in some it aspects. It did, huh? You know, and, and you had like the whole theater thing, so it almost it made you feel like all Renaissance and the Globe Theater from Shakespeare, the yeah. the, the theater where all you know in in London where Shakespeare played all you know, rich, played his first all his plays for the first time. Yeah, it, if, if you had that feeling, also, um, you know, the swamps made me think of you know very very like you know swampy like. Ireland or Scotland or something like that. Like it had it. It, it was very atmospheric uh, with that game, and, and some of the other themes I also saw were, were almost like a reflection of Final Fantasy itself. You know, with the right. return of the Black Mages, uh, more of a cla uh, of a class base of uh, characters in this game, and also kind of like an Easter egg when you find out one of the antagonists, the the main antagonist. 
Garland, which was Garland from Final Fantasy One, you know, and the and uh, the fact that you encounter uh, the corruptions of the crystal, like yeah. the ones in Final Fan in Final Fantasy One. Yeah. Um. So yeah, any other themes you saw or? That, that's pretty much that's pretty much my gist of it. I I'm gonna get really kind of pretentious here but i feel i need to okay, okay. <laughs> so you can all call me pretentious but final fantasy games the reason i'm attracted to them especially now that i'm older they all have very deep themes right thematic mm -hmm. value in terms of literary themes final fantasy 9's big thing and i think it affected most of the characters with the exception of maybe amarat and quina Mm -hmm. And maybe Ico to an extent, but every character had an existential crisis. Yeah, all of them. Um, Garnet, am I a princess? Who am I? Why am I here? You're not my real mother. What do I do? What's my purpose? You know, Vivi, why do I exist in the first place? Am I a weapon? Um, the main character is a Dane. We should have warned people. There's going to be spoilers. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> oh shit. Well, well, I'll put that in the description. Yeah. We should... My bad. Um, Zidane, existen, you know, his existential crisis. At first, he's this kind of cool, laid-back guy, kind of giving everyone advice. But then he finds out, I'm I'm a weapon myself. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a antichrist. Yeah. Essentially. Steiner, my duty's my whole life. But when I lose that duty, what am I? Mm-hmm. Um, Freya. I can't find my lover. Do I really need him? Can I? Am I capable? Every character had a fucking existential crisis. So the, I think the theme of Final Fantasy, you know, if you you look at um, seven, that theme was life and death. Eight is family, from what I recall, about you know family. Um, this one is about why do you exist? That's the big question. It's the song of life. <laughs> I, yeah, melodies of life. That fucking yeah, yeah, song. Yeah. <laughs> I but yeah, it, I, I know I sound pretentious, but that's when I was. And mind you, this is crazy because when I I hadn't played the game since I first played in two thousand, really, right? Yeah. I've had a couple of false starts, but now that I went through, you know, my remember, I'm a lit miner. Okay, so I look at shit like this, you know, and and that, that's what I saw in this game. And people can say, well, it's about characters with tails and you got a, fight, a giant fucking chef frog thing. But who cares? The, on the, the game is so much deeper than chef frog people or little black mage guys. Oh, yeah. And, and, even, and, and you know what? Even the final boss. Who is it, Kuja? Necron. Mm-hmm. His purpose is to just cause all of existence to to cease to exist. So even the final boss ties into that. So that's kind of how I felt about the themes. I don't know if you agree, Xander. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely, good point. Yeah. Uh, so now, now my next question was, uh, what was your favorite moment in the game? Hmm. My young teenage self loves the Alexander and Bahamut fight. Yes. That that fight is dope. Most intimate moment, or well, not intimate, but most quiet moment, I think it is... It's right before... Right after you beat the game. Right after you beat the boss. It's that last moment before, before between Garnett and Zidane. Oh, yeah. That was pretty good. Yeah, because it all came not, together. Not, not when they're reunited. Right when he, before he goes to save Kuja. Ah. Uh. And no one wants him to. Even Steiner, who hated him, doesn't want him to leave. Like it shows how much that group grew mm -hmm. together. And then I'll argue on a second moment is that narration during the ending, where Garnett says something like. This was the best moment of my life, but I have to accept the fact that it doesn't last forever, that you're gone or whatever. Because mm -hmm. that ending is sad. It's a happy ending, but it's a pretty sad ending. Yeah, it to... is. It is pretty sad. And when it, it's like after that initial ending, it's like almost like they had to like add a couple of things to kind of make you feel better because it was kind of depressing. <laughs> but end. you know what, Xander? 
<laughs> I just realized. But they didn't have no such thing in 10. <laughs> oh, no, yeah. That ending is fucking devastating. <laughs> Gosh. That ending's that's a devastating. At least 9 had a had a happier ending. Yeah. But it was still sad. But what about you? What's your favorite moment? Uh, my favorite moment, like you said, the, the Alexandria-Bahamut battle was awesome. Also, the part where Vivi, like, shoots off the crazy fire uh, spell on the ship and destroys the uh, Black Waltz. Oh, yeah. That was so yeah. cool. That was, that was so cool awesome. Moment. Because because of who Vivi was. He was like pretty much a, a seven-year-old little black mage. You know, and he, through the whole game, he's kind of being, he's hes very, like, to himself. He, he's, he doesn't have a whole lot of confidence. He's very shy. And it was like at that moment, you know, he had to save his friends, and he just, just like, shot off this crazy fire. And I was like, dude, that was freaking awesome. You know what moment makes me tear up before? And I'm, I'm a guy, so fuck you if you think we shouldn't cry. <laughs> but, um, but I know you agree with me, Xander, I think. But... There's a moment that makes me tear up right before that, where there's all those black mages and they defend him. Remember? Yes. And then you, and then they get to that beautiful CG scene, and you see all the black mages get wiped out, and you see that look in Vivi's face. That's yeah. so heartbreaking, man. Yeah. And you just and see all music. the, and you see all the black mages just falling out of the sky. Yeah. Mm. The black mages in that whole fucking game, fuck. Yeah. They remember when you're in the village, they just stop. He just stopped. And I'm there's that one black mage. This is another thing. I'm sorry. I, I you got me on a tangent here. They they have a grave, remember? Yeah. And, and they're talking to that black mage, and he says, This is this made me sad. Where he says, He just stopped moving, but maybe someday he'll wake up and I'll give him a bath. And I was like, Oh my fucking god. Yeah. And that's that's it, it, I get it might try to be funny, but I didn't find it. <laughs> Yeah, it was very tragic. It was it was uh, the the it, it was the outlook of you know what would happen if, if like something was created. You know, it was just it was really it was shitty. <laughs> yeah, that that game's sadder than people give credit to. Now, what what's what's your next uh, what's your next question? Because I don't want us to run too short on time. Okay, number two, right? Yeah. Okay, most relatable character. I I would have to say, I mean, it'd be really easy because when the game came out, I think you and I both can agree with this that you know I was also had my moments of being shy, so I I really I really identify with Vivi. I think I'm I think I think a lot of people did. That's the breakout character in that game. Not saying the rest of the characters suck. Yeah, I mean the characters are so good in that game. I mean, matter of fact, I love the fact that Zidane. Like he was a, um, he was kind of a, a suave guy, you know. He was the opposite of Cloud and Squall. I know, and I love that. I love the fact, and, and you know, when we talked about Final Fantasy thirteen, I told you about how like some of the beginning is the JRPGs, like they kind of, they kind of like just they had to grab my attention. That's what I liked about Final Fantasy nine. Final Fantasy nine started off with a heist to steal the princess. That was it. <laughs> yeah. That was it. I was just like, "Hey, this is kind of cool." You know, it <laughs> was a little kid sneak into a play. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't like you know, oh, you know, the world has been destroyed millions of years ago, and now we must depend on this. And oh, you know, it's just like, okay, all right, cool. You know, sometimes JRPGs get a little too heavy in the beginning, and just kind of like kind of start a little push, and you have like just something simple, and let it just unravel. And that's what Final Fantasy IX did. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I, I don't mind the world is destroyed as long as the execution afterwards. I treat it like a TV series, like yeah. I did, remember? Really think about JRPGs. Some of them are really like whole TV series because there's so many yeah. separate moments, and that's how I treat some of them. But yeah, sometimes they do start, yeah, the thousands of years ago, two gods fought, and now, you know. But sometimes, you know, like Grandia 2 did that, but the plot twist in that game saved it from being so generic i don't know how long ago you played gradia 2 but yeah it's been a long time but man that story was great but i agree with you though i i like the beginning of this because it was even other final fantasies blow up a reactor storm nars yeah um i got a cut of my face <laughs> <laughs> you know what i'm talking about. yeah 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 so there you go maybe a cut of my face is a little 
bit it's, it's squall. demeaning to that. Yeah, squall. <laughs> it's but, squall. <laughs> uh, you know what? I think he's more of a depressing character than Cloud. I think people like to shit on Cloud. Yeah, yeah. No, Squall was definitely um, Squall was the the dude in Breakfast Club, pretty much. Mm-hmm. What's your third question? A uh, third oh, question bad. is uh, favorite boss battle. Oh, um, I would say. That's hard because there's a lot. The boss battles in this are a little challenging, huh? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I'll say this: when you think, when you think of Final Fantasy IX, and you think of a boss battle. What's the very first battle that you think of, like this in your head that just really sticks out? Because psychologically, that's probably one of your favorites without even realizing it. Just because it's oh, you know, like, this boom. is not going to be everyone's favorite, but when the twins merge. Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah. What's their name? It was like Zonk and Zink or something like that. Yeah. Or something with a Z. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. I'm, I'm with you. I, I, I like, I like that boss battle when you find them at first and then they merge together. Mm-hmm. Because it was kind of a, of a, of a tough ch- battle. I'm also thinking, um, the battle with those dragons when you enter the final dungeon. Yeah. And I'll say the Necron battle, if you're underleveled, it's challenging. Yeah. The Necron battle is pretty memorable, too. What about you? Uh, I mean, I think I think the first battle you have with Kuja and you hear his, like, theme song. Oh, that. Yeah, doof, doof, doof. yeah it's pretty much like what I liked about it is I, I first heard it. And I just was like, we will, we will rock you. Because <laughs> it's totally you know, no, uh, boom, boom. You know, Macho does that a lot. Yeah, he does. He does. Uh just real quick, um, you know, in you 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 like six, right? I, yeah. We haven't really talked about six, surprisingly, but you know the um, the world of ruin the, when you're the the old the the world map theme on there that mm-hmm. dun, dun, you know that that's the beginning of a rush song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I I I've been listening to a lot of rush the last three years and. About three years ago, I heard that, and I thought I had the soundtrack to Final Fantasy VI on my phone, which I did, and it turned out to a restaurant. I was like, "What the fuck?" Oh yeah. But uh, did I say Nomura or Yuamatsu? I can't remember. But the oh, Final uh, Fantasy composer, like the Final yeah. Fantasy composer, Yuamatsu. Yeah. Yeah, but he he's a known rock fan. Yeah, he is. I mean, he had yeah. he had Ian Gilligan singing his battle theme and Blue Dragon. <laughs> that wasn't bad. A lot of people hated it, but it didn't bug me. And I like Blue Dragon. I did too. Yeah. Anyway, um, so Kuja's your favorite battle? Yeah. Just because I, I just like, I, I, that one secret boss you had that's just a free. What is it like? A just a big sphere? You that have big battle? planet thing? Yeah. That's like the Omega weapon, huh? Of this yeah, game. Yeah, that, that's so weird. It's like out of everything, like the one thing that beats your ass is just this big sphere. So simple. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. You know, I have... I never fought it. I, I tried, and I, I didn't. I never beat it. Maybe I can beat it now that it's on the... I have it on the Switch, and I can just turn all the, all the infinite lives on, then I can post on Facebook how I finally beat it. Dude, do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I beat, the, I beat the final... This boss after decades of trying. <laughs> Who would have who would have who would have thought infinite lives and infinite trance mode would have been the answer? <laughs> Crazy me. <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask you a question. Have you ever used the cheats? I used the, the the times three speed. You know, that's my only complaint about nine because uh, one thing that I got curious about was the transitions into battle and the battle themselves are really slow. Yeah. And you and then I, I plugged in seven and everything's so quick. Mm-hmm. And then just to make sure it wasn't because of the switch or anything, I did look at it from, you know, a PS one, uh, an unemulated PS one, right. Mm-hmm. On YouTube. And it's faster than nine. Uh, so I don't know why it went so quick. It was so, so slow in nine. I don't know. That's interesting there. But yeah, I used yeah. the I used the three times uh, battle just because of uh, this makes time go by a little bit faster on certain parts that I just already know about. I'm like, all right, let's speed through this a little bit. I accidentally used the battle assist once because one time I I clicked it and then I saw everyone going to trance and 
no one was near Trance well, at that point. I, I, I was like, I what do, the fuck? I do want to say <laughs> this. I do want to say this because I don't want to sound like I'm being like an elitist, being like, oh, you know, the only way to play a Jerry Apart RPG is to play it this way. I mean, I, I think of it this way, like, because I did the same thing with Fantasy Star. When I played mm. Fantasy Star on the Switch, I started out on, like, the uh, assist mode where it had gave me more experience points and blah, blah, blah. It was pretty much like cheat mode. But it was just because I just wanted to go through the game and just relive it. Uh, and right. you know, at the end of the day, if that's what you want to do, that's cool. That's cool. But I, I always, I was just poking fun about it because I've seen a lot of people be like, Oh, I finally got, I finally got a golden chocobo or I finally beat this guy. And it's like, well, of course you did. You had cheats on, you know? Yeah, we did <laughs> so, it. Yeah. Here's my, here's my thing on cheats. I think cheats are fine. My moral code is if I've played the game once, or in this case, I didn't use any because I have not played the game in years. Mm -hmm. That's fine. But if it's something like 7, which I played a bunch of times, but I don't plan it on the Switch playthrough because it's been about three years, I'll use cheats a little bit. Yeah. If you played it through. But I, I honestly think using cheats on single-player games is is totally fine. Mm -hmm. It's up to your preference. I'm not a big cheat guy. I know you're not. When I have a problem with cheats, it's on multiplayer games. Well, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. But that, but aside from that, you know, it's it's ultimate preference. And hell, but, I mean, I've I've played like like some retro games like with save states. I've done that, and some people look down on that. But I'll I'll use a fucking save state. You know what? To be fair, some of those games are way too hard. Yeah, they're. I mean, like I love Ninja Gaiden, but I'll I'll say you're. I don't think you're cheating if you use save states because that game's cheap. It's not hard. It's cheap hard. Yeah, there's a difference. So that's just how I feel about that. Mm -hmm. Now let's let's get into because okay, we're running close on time. Oh shit! Let's get I, into yeah. uh, your because I screen capped your third question. Is how do you rank Kuja in the other Final Fantasy villains? I think Kuja is super underrated. Agreed. He is very underrated. It's like you never hear anybody talk about Kuja. You hear more people talk about Kifka than Kuja. Well. I'm one of those guys. I like Kefka the best. Yeah. You know, um, or Sephiroth. Those are the two mm -hmm. big ones. Kefka or Sephiroth. Um, I think it depends because, like, you let's look at 8 for a second, okay? The way I look at 8, Ultima Sia is really a force of power that you're going against. Not really a villain. And that's fine. If that makes sense. Uh-huh. Like, you're really going against... A powerful force, like an entity, not really a villain. And from what I remember of 8, the character development is really focused on the good guys. Yeah, really. Which is. It was really good, from what I remember. So 8's purpose was different. Same with nine, with 10, aside from Seymour, who I think is a decent side villain. Yeah. He kind of fit but, that whole, he kind of fit that whole, like, Final Fantasy villain guy. But really, you know, the, the main villain was the unfair cycle of death in Final Fantasy. Ten was really the villain, mm -hmm. if you really think about it. Kuja, if you want to talk about physical villains, he's up there. I'm with you. I mean, he's better than X-Death. Who the fuck remembers him? Yeah. And then there was like, what, five different villains in four, if I recall? Mm hmm So I think Kuja might be number two for me. Yeah, he just has a... He's what's really interesting about him is he is, you know, made he was made as a vessel of destruction, but he also hates the fact that he was not made well enough to destruct everything. And you know who he reminds me of? Who's that? I bet you can guess. You can guess. You can take a guess. I I'm not sure. Liquid Snake. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, that I makes mean they're Wow! Go yeah. ahead. Now that you mention, now that you mention that, it, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, because when I was playing it, I was like, because I didn't put the connections at that time, but I thought about, it, I was like, fuck, he's like Liquid Snake. Mm -hmm. He's the inferior. Well, wasn't it revealed that Solid Snake was actually the inferior one in the end? I think so. There was a plot twist, and Liquid Snake was the superior one. I don't know. It's been a while since I played Metal Gear Solid. Which is a great game in itself. I, yeah. I should revisit that. But anyway, yeah, it's kind of like that. And he had an inferiority, inferiority complex. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to prove himself 
to his father figure. But what's interesting is when he finds out about that he's going to die, he has... Because the dame was not granted the lifespan, huh? Right. And again, you know what I thought about, too? Blade Runner, one of my favorite movies. Hmm. Because, you know, you've seen Blade Runner, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, lifespan. That's what the villains want to do. They want to expand their lifespan in uh, Blade Runner. And it's kind of like when Kuja finds out that he can't and that he's going to die, he says, that's not fair, and everyone must die with me. So he loses his mind. And I think that's a stark difference between him and Kefka because Kefka's already mad before he Yeah, Ke- Kefka, Kefka just wanted the world destroyed anyway. Like, he doesn't give a shit. You know, what makes you hate Kefka isn't his backstory. It's what he does. Yeah. You know, it's the things he does that makes was, you hate him and the glee was, he takes in it. Yeah, it was funny because, like, the moment Kuja got a sense of humanity, it drove him insane. The yeah. Thought, the thought of death, the thought that he wouldn't be around anymore, that's what set him over the edge, and that's what made him such an intense villain. I crazy. agree. Which is crazy to think about. Very, so what, very humanizing for a non-humanizing person. I agree. I agree. And it was a little bit of a nice contrast. Again, I love Kefka, but I think Kuja does not get the credit he deserves. Hmm. So I think I think Kuja should be up there. Well, I, I will say this. I want to skip one of my questions because one of my questions is kind of redundant. What is it, though? Just it like, my, my question was like, why would you recommend this? Oh, uh, I think that's kind of redundant because we've obviously we really love the game, <laughs> and if you listen to the episode, you probably know why we recommend it so much. So I'm just gonna say my last I, question. I, I'm gonna skip my fourth one because we already answered it too. Most tragic moment. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my last question is: uh, What is something in the game that you would change? The speed of battles. For me, it would be that stupid ass card game. That card game's okay. It's not as good as Triple Triad, though. I just I can't get into card games. Period. I don't I don't even like playing like real life card games. Okay. <laughs> well, yeah, I under I under I, you know the the problem with trading tradable card because there's there's two kinds. There's limited card games and true and tradable card games. Limited ones are everything's in the box. Everyone you have to play what's what's there. Yeah. Trading card games are the ones where, like, Magic the Gathering and such. And I think you would enjoy a limited card game more than a trading one because Mm -hmm. this problem is actually in Final Fantasy IX. You may not have good cards, and you'll beat some other fucker with shit cards, with better cards, and they'll beat you, and that's what happens in real life. Yeah. Yeah, and I like the fact that, I mean, well, one of the things I didn't like about it was it got to the point where they introduced you to it, and then it got to the point where I was like, all right, you're going to have to play the game now. And I'm like, I don't want to play this card game. (laughs) Can we agree on something, though? What's that? It's better than Blitzball, dude. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Fuck. Worst minigame in a Final Fantasy. Yeah. Yeah. (sighs) Okay. So your last I got, question. Yep, I'll ask it. How do you feel about the two world concept in the game? I thought it was kind of cool, just because that was like you're you're referring to the 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 crystal world compared to the the real world. The real world, and then Kuja and uh, the Danes world mostly. Yeah. Remember how uh, that world was trying to destroy Gaia? I think is the name of the of the main world to preserve mm-hmm. itself. Mm-hmm. Remember the whole soul transfer thing? Oh, uh, yeah. 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 yeah I, it's been a while since I've played. I'm trying to remember it. Cause I remember like, cause I, I was thinking of, it was like the, the, the other, like, cr- cause it, was, it had to do with the crystals though. Right. Yes. That's right. Well, there, well, the crystal world is the final, the crystal world, the way I looked at it mm-hmm. at the end of the game was, it's the center of the Final Fantasy multiverse. Yeah. And he didn't want to just destroy the world. He wanted to destroy everything. Mm-hmm. So he so there's a, a grand crystal that I guess from what I understand preserves the whole universe. So they weren't just saving the world, they were saving the universe from Kuja. Oh wow. Yeah. This game's still fresh. I beat it a couple weeks ago, so 
Yeah, it's been a because I've played a, I've played some of it on the Switch. I haven't beaten it yet, but it's been a, it's been a while since I've beaten it. But I remember it, I remember like a lot of it because it's one of my favorites. I'll tell you series. something to look forward to when you beat it, though. What's that? You you unlock all the movies and you can watch them whenever. Oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. So you unlock all the movies and then you get a blackjack game. You can play blackjack. Oh joy. I know you don't <laughs> like card games. <laughs> I don't know what the point of playing blackjack is though. I, I, that? I have no idea. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's really a weird thing. But yeah. Yeah, so you can look forward to Blackjack, Xander. <laughs> Hell yeah. What did you, you think about the, the two-world concept? I liked it, and it's something that Final Fantasy does a lot yeah. in different ways. Um, I think uh, 6 the, is the big other one. You know, It's still the same world, but it's a different world because the world gets destroyed, essentially. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you do, do it in this one. And then even 13, I know you don't like 13, but there was the world above and the world below. Didn't even uh, Final Fantasy X kind of had that too, right? The dream, yeah the uh, the dream Zanakin. Yeah, the dream Zanakin I where mean, uh, hell, Titus is from. Hell, you could even say that they have it in Final Fantasy VII with the cloud psychosis. Yeah, yeah, I can agree to that. And then even if I remember at eight, you go into the future or something. Mm -hmm. Right at the end of the game. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, Final Fantasy does the true world concept a lot. Hmm. I, I, so, yeah, did you ever think about that? I, ne I never thought about it. Never thought about I didn't it think way. about, I didn't think about it until I wrote that question. That is interesting, though. Yeah, it seems, 15, even 15 does it to a degree. They have their own world of ruin, remember? Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. So... I don't know. <sighs> but, Xander, let me ask you one last thing, and I think we could close it out on this. How do you feel about Final Fantasy IX in general? It's it's probably one of my favorite Final Fantasies of all time. Like, I'm I, with I, you. I love it. I love the, the soundtrack, the, the art style, the story. It was a great swan song of the PlayStation 1 era in general, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it was the last Final Fantasy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's 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 a good one to go off. I, I think those three Final Fantasy. I know eight gets a lot of shit, but I enjoyed eight when I played it. Yeah. So even if I don't like it now, I got some value out of it back in the day. Yeah. It's definitely... So I. So I think the three Final Fantasies on PlayStation went out with a bang. Yeah, I would agree. I don't know if you know this though. Real quick trivia, but did you know that this was intended to be a side game? I didn't know that. And the reason it was intended to be a side game was there was debate over some of the people in, in, in Square thought Final Fantasy evolved into what 8 was and that they should proceed with the more futuristic elements. Ah. But I think Sakaguchi said Final Fantasy needs to differentiate itself. So while, while this game was in development, which a lot of people don't know, it was in development. It started development midway through 8's development. That's why it was released so quickly. It makes so, sense. So, yeah. And what's really neat about it, my friend, is is that they made it into a full game because they, they came to the conclusion that, Final, like I said, Final Fantasy needs to differentiate itself, not just be futuristic things, which I think it has carried that. Because, you, you know, despite how we feel about 12, 12 is a little bit more of a medieval game. 13 is kind of a technological game. 14 goes back to the medieval roots. Wouldn't you agree? Oh, yeah, definitely. And we both love fourteen. We now, gotta do 14, a show. Fourteen is like a love letter to Final Fantasy fans. You know, I want to go back to fourteen because it's the Final Fantasy that does never that never ends. It's it's the no Final Fantasy. So, and and like I said, it's a love letter. There's so many elements of other Final Fantasies in the universes. I mean, I mean from the from the time that Lightning comes back and you fight with her to battling Kifka. Mm -hmm. You know, they. I mean, they have a whole DLC that's like. Final Fantasy IV based. Yeah. I want to ask you something, Xander. Maybe one of these days, I know you and I are strapped on time. Mm -hmm. We can agree on that. But one of these days, I think we should go back to 14. Yeah. Yeah, one day be nice. I just got to make sure I have $15 because there's so much shit coming out. Like Cuphead. <laughs> so, yeah. There you go. But that's all I got to say. Nine's a great game. 
Indeed, indeed. And, uh, yeah, this is going to wrap up another episode. Uh, for folks that are listening, definitely leave some comments. Tell us some of the things that you like and uh, gush about some Final Fantasy IX. We'll be joining in the comments. And, uh, yeah, we'll be back very soon. So until next time, we're blasting off to another episode. <laughs>